mid-century, we're going to have about 10 billion people on the planet. We'll need a 50% increase in the amount of food we produce in order to feed them. They'll be using energy at an increased rate, putting more carbon in the atmosphere. And on top of that, uh, many of the drugs that fight diseases will no longer be effective because organisms have grown resistant to them. Today, I'm going to talk about engineering biology to solve these challenges. First, I want to describe where we get most of our products. They come from petroleum. We bring it up from underground, we refine it, we turn it into fuels, and when we burn those fuels in our automobiles or in our jets, we put that carbon in the atmosphere. We also produce nearly all of our products, our materials, our chemicals, uh, using petroleum, as well as a number of drugs. We'd like to have a renewable future where we take renewable feedstocks and turn them into all of those same products. In the cases of fuels, when you burn those then in your automobile, that carbon is returned to the atmosphere and you don't add net carbon to the atmosphere. Doing all this can save a huge amount of energy. It can also lead to a renewable future. But I want to talk about that biorefinery just a minute. The center, the hub of that biorefinery is the microbe. That microbe takes the sugars from the renewable biomass and turns it into chemicals. Prior to the genetic engineering revolution in the 1970s, we used natural organisms. But now we have the potential uh, of genetic engineering. We can take genes from any organism, from plants, from humans, from microbes, from snakes, uh, put them into a microbe and get that microbe to produce things that are completely unnatural to biology. We use this iterative design, build, test, learn cycle to engineer biology and do that repeatedly till we get it right. I want to tell you about one example from my laboratory. Artemisinin is the world's best anti-malarial drug, but it's too expensive as it's produced from the plant. So we took the genes from the plant, Artemisia, we crafted them, put them into Saccharomyces yeast, brewer's yeast, and got it to produce this drug. And now Sanofi is marketing artemisinin combination therapies based on this. We did a similar thing, taking genes from plants, which put the hydrocarbons on the leaves that make the waxy surface, and we engineered microbes to produce advanced biofuels that are now fueling planes and buses all over the world. Engineering biology is an expensive process. It takes a lot of time, and that's demonstrated here. The Artemisinin project that I talked to you about was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It took $50 million to accomplish that science and 10 years worth of work. A similar project by DuPont to produce carpet fibers using uh, a product from E. coli took them about $130 million in 15 years. Because of these extreme costs, it's very hard to get biologically produced products into the market. The reason it's so expensive is because biology is practiced in an artisanal manner. We have these artists, graduate students, who work at the uh, desktop, they design their biology, then they go into the laboratory and build it and over months test it. And then we learn whatever we can from that, but the learning process is slow. That's the past. The present is having foundries for biology, where uh, our students now design the biology on the computer using computer-aided design software. They send those designs to robots in the next door lab. The robots build the uh, biology, they test it, and then we use machine learning to collect all the information and analyze it. But in the very near future, what we'll have are distributed or foundries that are centrally located. They won't have to be next door to you. The designer will, at their desk, design the biology. That design will be sent off to a factory somewhere. You may not even know where that factory is. It'll choose the best factory. When that design is perfected, the factory will send it back to you. And the beauty of this is that that factory can learn from all the organizations that use it. Companies won't have to have their own foundries. Uh, Academic labs won't have to have their own foundries. They can use the central foundries, and they'll collect the learnings from all of these and distribute biological components out to companies as well as to academics and industry. Farther into the future is where we actually have something very near to what Paul talked about, actually having a 3D printer for biology, where you might design at the desktop, and right sitting beside you is the, uh, all the robotics, everything needed to build a microbe, to build a plant. You could say, uh, build a design for engineering the photosynthetic uh, efficiency of a plant so that it produces more corn or more peas. We can engineer microbiomes in our gut so that uh, we can get better access to drugs so that they might even produce the drugs. We can engineer microbes to produce new chemicals, new fuels, and even new classes of antibiotics to fight diseases where they've grown resistant to them. So what I've talked to you today about are building foundries for biology for the future. We can solve a huge number of problems using this new technology that we've developed. 
The question I have for you is what problems would you like to solve? And if you can do anything, if you can print anything with biology, who should be able to use that? How far can we go in printing biology? Can we print new humans? Thank you.